I'm welcoming you myself on the visit. If you've come on a good Sabbath, it's potluck Sabbath. I believe we have potluck Sabbaths first, third, and fifth. when we have a fifth month, mm -hmm. fifth Sabbath, yeah. which was last Sabbath. We're studying the book of Galatians this quarter, and today we're studying Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 21. Last Sabbath, we concluded our study on a very positive note, because the council at Jerusalem had agreed that outward circumcision was never anything more than a visual sign of the circumcision of the heart. So when the circumcision of the heart was absent, the visual circumcision was a fraud. But when the circumcision of the heart was present, then you could dispense with the visual circumcision. It was decided to draft a letter by the leaders of the church in Jerusalem. That was Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, and John, itemizing the issues that had been discussed in great detail and quite animated and that had been voted on at the council in Jerusalem. Specifically, that circumcision was not a requirement to be saved. And that the new converts to Christianity at the church in Antioch, especially the Gentile converts to Christianity, and everywhere else, of course, should abstain from eating meat that had been offered to what? Idols. As well as meat that had been strangled and the blood of that meat. Also included, of course, was abstaining from fornication or sexual immorality. The letter was to be delivered by the delegates that had been chosen at the church in Antioch to attend the meeting in Jerusalem. And that was Paul, Barnabas, Silas, and Judas. And this letter was to be read in front of all of the Jewish teachers at Antioch, as well as the converts to Christianity, Gentiles and Jews to Christianity. And for that matter, that letter was to be read wherever a new church was raised in the Gentile world. For a time, everything went well. Even Peter decided to go up to Antioch and visit the church. And that made a very, very positive impression on the Gentile converts to Christianity because it showed them that Peter was bringing or suppressing his natural prejudice to interact with Gentiles, especially to sit at the same table with them. This was a challenge for Peter. But sometime later, at a large meeting in the church of Antioch, a group of delegates sent from Jerusalem by James showed up unexpectedly at this meeting. And the moment that Peter saw these Jewish converts to Christianity, some of them converted Pharisees, when Peter saw them come into the room, he immediately withdrew himself from the presence of the Gentile converts to Christianity. He was not the only one. Some of the leaders 
of the church at Antioch withdrew themselves also. Even Barnabas. Barnabas. Paul's co-evangelist in reaching out to whom? To the Gentiles. They withdrew themselves from the presence of the Gentile converts to Christianity. This revelation of hypocrisy among respected and loved leaders of the church in Antioch had a devastating impression on the Gentile converts to Christianity. What were these men saying by withdrawing themselves from the presence of the Gentile converts to Christianity? What were they saying? Better. Huh? They were better. They were denying Christ. Now, this behavior by these respected and loved leaders was unintentional. But what they were really saying is that faith in Jesus is a good thing. But it's not enough. Which meant that they still believe that circumcision and observing the ceremonial laws of the Israelites still was necessary as a requirement for what? Salvation. Paul immediately recognized the subverting and painful influence that this double standard would have on the Jewish converts to Christianity, but especially the Gentile converts to Christianity. And Paul openly rebukes Peter. Let's begin by looking at Galatians chapter 2, and I would like for someone to volunteer to read the subheading, the subheading between verse 10 and 11 of Galatians chapter 2. No return to the law. Say that a little louder. No return to the law. No return to the law. Does anyone else have a subheading between verse 10 and 11? No what? Same way. Okay, anyone else? Peter opposed by who? Paul. Okay. <coughs> who would like to read for us verses 11, 12, and 13 of Galatians chapter 2? Carl. Now when Peter had come to Antioch, I would stood with him to his face, because he was to be blamed for before certain men came from James, he would eat with the, with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with, her, with their hypocrisy. Thank you. The author of the book Acts of the Apostles <coughs> speaks specifically to this incident. Let me read it to you. It's found on page 198, Acts of the Apostles. Quote, Peter saw the error into which he had fallen and immediately set about repairing the evil that had been wrought so far as was in his power. God, who knows the end from the beginning, permitted Peter to reveal this weakness of character in order that the tried apostle 
might see that there was nothing in himself whereof he might boast. End quote. Let's continue by reading verse 15. I'm sorry. Verse 14 of uh, Galatians chapter 2. Who would like to read verse 14 for us? Anyone? Okay. Linda? But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, If you, being a Jew, live in the manner of the Gentiles and not of the Jews, why do you compel the Jews, not as the Jews, why do you compel the Gentiles to live as Jews? Thank you. Now 15, please. Who are we, Jews by nature, and not sinners of the Gentiles? Thank you. What is Paul saying here? We are Jews by nature. Sorry. Is Paul saying that the Gentiles were sinners, but the Jews were not sinners? immediately adds what? That we too have believed in whom? In Jesus Christ. In verse 15. Who you just read verse 15. So what Paul is saying is that the Jews were sinners. But they were Jewish sinners, not Gentile sinners. That's what he's really saying there. Since this is true, what did this mean to the Gentile converts to Christianity? I don't think they feel unwanted and unloved. But isn't Paul saying, look, we Jews are sinners. We're Jewish sinners. You guys are Gentile sinners. But what? We're saying sinners. We're equal. <clears throat> right. So the Gentile converts to Christianity were learning here that they too could be saved directly by the faith of Jesus. Without going through the dead forms of the old covenant rituals, which had been done away with at the cross, if you believe that Christ was the Messiah. So they said to themselves, we heard the gospel correctly from Paul. <coughs> Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. 1 Timothy <coughs> chapter 1, verse 15. Who would like to read that for us? 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. Volunteer. Mary Jane. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the chief. So, what Paul is saying is that a circumcised sinner is no better in the sight of God than an uncircumcised sinner. We Seventh-day Adventists need to understand the significance of that. We Seventh-day Adventist sinners are no better than sinners that have no church affiliation. Sin is sin. Sinners are sinners. Whether you have a church membership or you don't. Is Christ the sacrifice for all sins? Yes. As well as the sins of the world. Is that scriptural? Let's take a look at 1 John 2.2. 1 John 2.2. When we study with people or we interact with people about in a Christian environment or in a social environment or studying the Bible with them, it is crucial that they see us 
the same way that God sees everybody. We may know a few more things than they do at this point in time, but that does not make us any better than anyone else. Amen. And if we're not experiencing this knowledge that we have, all this knowledge that we have is absolutely useless. Who would like to read 1 John 2.2? Over here. My little children, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Thank you. What was that? <coughs> and two. First, that was not first John. Yeah. Yeah. Two, two, two. 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 two also. Read two also. Oh, no. We need verse two. Okay. And he himself is the perpetuation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Amen. Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 4.10. Jesus is the sacrifice. The word propitiation is sacrifice. Jesus is the sacrifice for the whole world. The word world is cosmos. The human race. Those that benefit from his sacrifice are the ones that accept the sacrifice. Do we understand that? But Jesus is the savior of the world. When we interact with people, it's very important that we make that clear distinction. When God inspires a human being to record God's inspired thought, should we assume that as far as God is concerned, this is important? When God inspires a person in the Old or the New Testament to record God's inspired thought, five times in half a sentence, should you and I take notice that this is not only important, but we better understand it very, very clearly. I'm going to read to you now verse 16 of Galatians chapter 2, and I want for you to participate. I want for you to participate by counting with the fingers of one hand how many times the Apostle Paul says the same thing in the positive. And with the fingers of another hand, I want for you to count how many times the Apostle Paul says the same thing in the negative. Here we go. Galatians chapter 2 verse 16. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through the faith of Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus, that we may be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. Since by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. How many times does the Apostle Paul say the same thing in the positive? In the positive. Three, two. two. How many times does it say the same thing in the negative? Three. Three. Very good. The meaning of the word justified is made righteous. In a court rule of law, in the secular world, we declare a man justified when we find that that man has done nothing wrong that he has been accused of. Do we not? Yes. But since all of us have sinned, how many of us need justification and made righteous? Oh. Oh. <coughs> many do not understand the purpose of God's law. Some people actually are fearful of God's law. How do you think God wants for us to understand His law intellectually and relate to it? Let's find out from Scripture. 
I need a volunteer to read Romans 7. Romans chapter 7. And a volunteer to read Romans 9, 30 and 31. Volunteer for Romans 7, 12. Number left. Thank you. What does that mean? The commandment of the law is what? Holy, just, and good, and some virgin versions say righteous. That's a sermon in itself right there. Satan says that God's law is not just. Because no one can keep it. That's what he did in heaven. He succeeded in deceiving one third of the population in heaven. Heaven, where I assume all of you want to be taken to someday. Amen. In that atmosphere of heaven, where you could interact with God one on one, with Jesus and the Holy Spirit, Satan succeeded in deceiving a third of the population up there in rebelling against God. Because God's law, he said, was unjust. No one could keep it. God was being unfair to make that requirement of the population of heaven. That's pretty powerful deception, isn't it? I think we should understand this very, very clearly. Who would like to volunteer to read Romans 9? Romans 9, 30 and 31. Tom? What shall we say then? It's that Gentiles who do not pursue righteousness attain righteousness even in the righteousness which is by faith. But Israel, pursuing a law of righteousness, did not arrive at that law. Thank you. After Paul's conversion, his appreciation for the law of God made a 180 degree turn. Because Paul recognized that God's law is what? Just, holy, good, and righteous. And that law of God demands justice, holiness, and righteousness. But he also realized that that law that makes that demand of the human race cannot deliver. Mm. Let me read it to you. When we understand the purpose of God's law, our attitude towards the law is going to change like it did for Paul. I'm reading to you from Philippians chapter 3. Uh, to get the full meaning, let's go to verse 2 if you want to. If you want to follow, I'll wait a moment. Philippians chapter 3. He's writing to warn the people in Philippi that they're going to hear different versions of the gospel. And one of the versions is that the Jewish converts to Christianity are going to tell them what we have been studying here for five weeks, six weeks today. That circumcision is a requirement to be saved. And observing all the laws of Moses is also a requirement. So he's writing to the people in Philippi, called the book of Philippians, and he begins in verse 2 by saying, Beware of the dogs. That's not a complimentary statement. You may be a pet, pet lover, but 
He's using the word dogs here as the bottom of the barrel. Mm -hmm. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision, the visual circumcision, where there is no heart circumcision. Mm -hmm. Verse 3, for we are the true circumcision who worship in the Spirit of God, glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in what? The flesh. In circumcision. The visual circumcision. Now, look at what he says between verses 4 and 6. Although I myself might have confidence in the flesh or the works of the flesh, if anyone else has a mind to put confidence in the flesh, I more than all of you put together. Verse 5. Circumcised on the eighth day, of the nation of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law, a Pharisee. There you have it. What did the Pharisees... What were the Pharisees so proud of? <laughs> Their outward keeping of the law. Their false righteousness. Yes. Which Paul calls the false Circumcision. Mm -hmm. Verse 6. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness, which is in the law, found mm -hmm. blameless. There you have it. That's what he's talking about right here. In verses 7, uh, Romans 7, 12, and 9, 30 through 31. So Paul is saying... I understand now, after my conversion, that the law is what? Holy, just, good, and righteous. But I also realize that that same law cannot produce that righteousness or that justification in me. Mm -hmm. Did we get it? Yes. Do we understand this? Yes. Was God's purpose in giving the law to justify us? No, no. No. But Satan, the master of deception, has connected that because Satan knows that my sinful nature would rather work on keeping or performing the Ten Commandments rather than dying to self. Mm. Amen. Now, you may not have that problem, but that's my problem since I was born. Let's take a look at Romans 8, 3, and 4. Romans 8, 3, and 4. Romans 8, 3 is the only scripture in the Bible that specifically, directly focuses on the nature of Christ. There are other scriptures in the Bible that deal with the nature of Christ in an indirect way. But Romans 8, 3 is the only scripture in the Bible that directly, specifically isolates the topic of Jesus' nature. Uh, since there are some interruptions here that I'm going to have to make, I'm going to read verse 3 and 4. Everybody at Romans 8? Yes. <laughs> For what the law could not do, we just learned that. We learned it from the person that's writing it right here. Mm -hmm. He recognizes that the law is what? Holy, just, good, and righteous. But there's something that the law cannot do. And that's what he's saying right here. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did. Sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. It's crucial that we understand three words here. In the likeness of sinful flesh. That's not a verb, sinful flesh. That's an adjective. Speaking of the condition of the human race and the condition that Jesus had to identify with in his sinless, divine nature, he had to take on my sinful nature in order to ethically and legally save me. And that's, that's what that word means there in, in Romans 8.3. The uh, Greek word is uh, homoioma. Look it up. It means mixing something together. 
in the likeness of sinful flesh and as an offering for the sin problem, again, that's an adjective, not a verb, dealing with the sin problem, he condemned the sin problem in whose flesh? His flesh. How could he condemn something that he did not have in himself to condemn? Does that make Jesus a sinner? 